Welcome to this webinar hosted by the European Humanities University in Vilnius. My name is Maximus Milda and I'm pleased here today to welcome you at the webinar called Access to Medicine in Pandemic Times. What's law got to do with it? Today the webinar will be hosted by Niada Mulali. There is a lecture at the Department of Social Sciences at EHU and in particular she's a member of the faculty of the International European Union Law Programme. Uh, the webinar today will be moderated by Associate Professor Maxim Timofeyev of EHU's Department of Social Sciences. And today's webinar will discuss how patent law facilitates access to medicine and critical medical, medical equipment in times of national or global health emergencies like COVID-19. Niada Molale will provide an overview of compulsory li licensing provisions and their role in light of the approval of a COVID-19 vaccine, drug or diagnostic method. I am quite confident that today's webinar is enormously useful for all of those who are not only eager to study international law and to learn more about how international law facilitates uh, various, various avenues, how we tackle global pandemics, but also for all of those interested, interested in understanding the rapidly changing world that we're living in and uh, how disruptive global pandemics have be has been and what's the role of international law here. So dear colleagues, dear Niada, dear Maxim, I'm happy to pass the floor to you and uh, eager to learn more during today's webinar. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, thank you. So today uh, we are going to talk about quite an exciting, exciting topic. Uh, you know that uh, during the times of uh, pandemic of COVID-19, uh, the countries around the world faced a lot of issues. But the ones that uh, attracted a lot of uh, attention, everybody's attention, in fact, was uh, the issues of medicines, uh, medical equipment. You know that the issue of vaccine is now uh, very urgent and a lot of countries are developing, developing these vaccines. A lot of private, um, uh, private hospitals and private um, scientific institutions are developing the vaccine. And uh, today we are not going to talk about the uh, uh, medical part of it, but we are going to, going to talk about legal part of it. What's law have um, uh, got to do with it? So basically, what are the legal modalities of uh, the issues that the countries face with medicine, equipment, and vaccines? So uh, with, that, uh, with that, I would like to give a floor to Nyada Mulali. Niada, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maxim. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us in this webinar, which we'll discuss, as uh, already mentioned by my colleagues, uh, the issue of access to medicine in pandemic times. What I would like to do today is start by telling you a story. Now, in March 2020, the whole world's eyes were on Italy. It was the first European country in which we had a widespread uh, COVID-19 um, epidemic. Uh, the numbers of new cases of infected people were rising every day. The numbers of deaths, unfortunately, were in the hundreds. And at this time, the health system in Italy was uh, struggling. There was not enough personnel to attend to all the patients. And also there was not enough medical equipment, masks, uh, protective gears, in particular ventilators. It is under these circumstances that our story takes place. Uh, these two young people are two Italian engineers, Alessandro, and Christian. Following the news, just like we were doing from every part of the world, and also having friends and relatives uh, submitted in hospitals due to COVID-19, these two young engineers wanted to help. Uh, the hospital where um, most of their friends were, were submitted in Brescia had uh, ran out of the bulbs that are necessary in order to operate a ventilator. So these are one-time bulbs that need to be replaced every time a patient uses the equipment. 
they were signaled by a uh, famous physician's professor about the need for help. And given that they work in a startup in Italy, Isinova, which deals with um, production of silicone bags, uh, earthquake equipments, bicycles, etc., they own the 3D printer. So their field of activity was not related to medicine, but they had an equipment which might be used to print these uh, replaceable valves. They tried to phone the original manufacturer of the valves, uh, who unfortunately was at the time not able to meet the rising demands about these valves. So they could not produce the valves fast enough for the patients to, to use them. So they call in order to secure the design of the valve so that they could try to print it using their 3D printers. Uh, however, uh, the personnel of the company replied that they could not give the design because the design was property of the company. And second, because it would be illegal for them to uh, copy and to produce this valve. Uh, regardless of the answer, uh, our two young engineers went ahead. They went to the hospital, they studied the valve came up with a digital blueprint of it. And within the next two days, they managed to um, produce 100 replaceable ventilator uh, valves, so-called Venturi uh, valves. Now, many of you might be thinking a couple of questions, which I think are relevant for a potential or future um, student of a law school. The first question would be, did the uh, manufacturer of the valve uh, act in a legal way? So was it within its legal rights to reject to provide these engineers with the design of the valve? The answer to that question is yes, because the valve was patented. So the company once they invented this particular valve, had registered the patent in order to protect the valve. Now, what does it mean to have a patent on our uh, object of interest here, the replaceable uh, valve? So patent is a legal means that would allow the inventor uh, to uh, prevent others from uh, using the product or the process without prior authorization. Now, the protection is granted in, in uh, special circumstances or rather subject to certain conditions. So these conditions are three. The invention, so in our case, the bold, uh, would have to meet three requirements. It would have to be novel. It would have to uh, include an inventive step and it would have to have an industrial application. So it's said in simpler words, given that I suppose most of you are prospective students of the European Humanities University. Uh, this would mean that the valve in question would have to be something that had not been used before, that one could not find by searching into the knowledge uh, in relation to the production and usage of such valves. It would have to have an inventive step, which would mean that an expert in the production of such valves would not be able to logically use the principles and the knowledge known and come up with such a valve. So it would need some, some additional uh, input. It's not simply logical application of knowledge in the field. And third, it needs to be useful. Said in simple words, it needs to have an application. Now, once a patent is granted, the patent uh, gives or assigns exclusive rights to the patent owner. So in our case, the original manufacturer of the valve had the right to, um, to prevent uh, third persons from using, producing, distributing, selling, uh, importing, exporting the valve. Also, the producer has the exclusive right to assign a license, to assign uh, or, or rather to authorize the use of this valve from another company or another person. This would be the meaning of a, 
of a license. So if all these exclusive rights are infringed or are violated, said differently, we are in front of the patent infringement uh, case. Now, why do we have to provide patents? Let's talk a bit about this and then we will return to our story. So the reason why uh, we provide patents is in order to promote inventions and technological uh, advancement, but also in order to encourage uh, young scientists, but also the investors that stand behind them and support the research process with funds to encourage all of them to continue producing. And in order for them to continue researching, to continue producing, they need to have a stimulus. And this stimulus comes from the exclusive rights which are granted from a patent for a limited period of times, which are translated also in financial, uh, in financial terms or said differently in profit. This was the reason why we try to encourage inventors and investors uh, to support the research and development process. But what's in it for the society? What's in it for us? Uh, what is in it for us is the use of the product or the process after the protection of the patent expires. So the protection of the patent is limited, is usually for a term of 20 years. Once this term expires, then the product and the process becomes part of the public domain, which means that we can use it. And in circumstances uh, related to health and medicine, it means that other companies may try to produce the bulb in our question, in our, uh, in our case, or um, medicine, vaccines, and so on. Now let's get back to our, um, to our story. We said that um, the fact that the engineers produced the bulb without the authorization of the original manufacturer constitutes an infringement of patent, the rights of the patent holder. So some of you, or maybe all of you, might legitimately be thinking, so in these difficult times where we live in many countries of the world, um, there have been uses of 3D uh, printers in order to produce bulbs, but also special ventilator masks, which have come as a result of modification of snorkeling masks and other uh, protective gear. So do all these people face a lawsuit for patent infringement? In a normal situation, the answer would be yes. So the patent owner would be within its full rights to sue all these people in their respective court for infringing the patent, for producing a protected product without authorization. However, we do not live in normal times. We are in, in, in the course of a pandemic. Now, luckily for our Italian engineers, and for us, the original company that produced the Venturi bulb uh, didn't press uh, the two engineers to stop the production, so they didn't file any suit. There were other cases of companies which have uh, voluntarily declared that they would not pursue uh, patent infringement um, lawsuits. In this regard, I would like to mention the I would like to mention the example of Abvi, which is an American pharmaceutical, which is in the process of approving an antiviral drug called uh, Calentra, which arguably uh, can be used it can be used to treat uh, COVID nineteen disease. So we have isolated cases of um, companies which have um, common sense and the goodwill to let go of their exclusive rights in relation to patents in order to allow um, to allow other companies or individuals to produce necessary uh, drugs or, or equipment. However, we do not need to resort to the goodwill of, of the companies. 
Why? Because patent law provides for a provision on compulsory licensing, which is particularly suitable in cases as, uh, um, as the one we are currently living, so in case of national and international uh, health emergency. Now, what is compulsory licensing? Uh, compulsory licensing is a tool that would allow a government or organs authorized by a government to use a patent even without the approval of the patent owner. So in our case, um, had they followed the, the course of a compulsory licensing uh, uh, route, our engineers would have been uh, entitled to uh, reduce the box without risking any infringement suit by the patent owner. Had there been a compulsory license assigned to them, which differently said would mean had they had a permission to uh, produce this vault even without uh, getting the, the authorization of the patent owner. Now, these provisions are uh, to be applied in specific cases. So this is not uh, a license, this is not a permission that would be granted in any case. Uh, for our purposes, such a route or such a tool is available and it's applicable in cases of extreme health emergency. And I cannot think of a more extreme and emergent situation than the one we are, we are currently living. Um, this tool means indeed that um, the, uh, the licensing is mandatory, but it doesn't mean that it is for free. So still there is an obligation, even when um, the government or the ministry which is responsible to grant these licenses um, decides to, to, to grant it, there is an obligation to provide an adequate remuneration to the patent, uh, to the patent owner. Now, in normal situations, there would have to be a, a good faith attempt of the potential users of this license with the patent owner to reach an amicable agreement or to negotiate on a remuneration on a voluntary basis without going through uh, an application for a compulsory license. Uh, however, in uh, cases of national and international health emergency, like we are today, this step can be bypassed in the interest of speed. Now the scope and the duration of these licenses is limited. So in case a pharmaceutical company would get the license to produce, let's say, a vaccine, a COVID-19 vaccine, which we are all hoping we will soon see. Uh, this company would have to produce uh, the vaccine for a specific duration, which might be either until the end of the patent uh, protection term, or in these cases, most likely, until the end of the state of national emergency, which uh, the majority of the countries in the world have in place uh, today. And the scope of this license would be limited. This means that the pharmaceutical company would not be allowed to produce these drugs and sell them for profit. The drugs would have to be produced um, usually only for usage between, uh, within, excuse me, the territory of the country where the license applies. So it's not meant to be used for commercial uh, and for profit, uh, for profit purposes. There are some additional uh, safeguard measures which aim at preventing any potential abuse with these licenses. And uh, in this regard, um, I would like to mention special labeling and packaging requirements. So stating that this vaccine, for example, would be uh, only um, applicable for sale or for use within the territory of Italy, for example, in the case of our, our Volvo, if it is a uh, a license that would apply to, to Belarus or to Lithuania, it would be specified in there that the production is aimed or is destined only for either Belarus or, um, or Lithuania, for example. And also there would have to be um, 
some notification and, uh, and publication requirements with regard to the decision to grant, uh, to grant the, the license. So the patent owner would have to be notified that, the, the, uh, that there is a compulsory license on a product that this uh, manufacturer produces. And in some cases, uh, for example, in Canada, in India, or in Switzerland, there is also a uh, requirement to notify, um, uh, excuse me, to publish the decision to assign a compulsory license on either the official journal or on the website of the intellectual property office of these countries. Uh, in addition, there is also a requirement to um, notify the Council of TRIPS. TRIPS stands for Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Agreement. Uh, with regard to uh, this, uh, the issuing of the license. Uh, why is TRIPS involved? In case some of you are uh, thinking about this, TRIPS is involved because TRIPS is the international uh, convention which uh, legitimates, how to say, or which provides for compulsory licensing. So that would be the legal basis for a compulsory licensing legislation in Lithuania, in Belarus, in Italy, or in other, uh, in other countries of the, of the world. So this would be uh, an initial presentation on, um, on compulsory licensing and on how compulsory licensing could be used uh, today. There are in fact, um, in many countries of the world, Compulsory licensing, let's start with this, is not a new type of provision. So many countries in the world have enacted legislation that provides for compulsory, uh, for compulsory licensing. However, today what we notice is a tendency in certain countries to enact an additional legislation um, which would provide for special conditions uh, tailor-made to the COVID-19 pandemic that we are living today. Uh, in this regard, there is the example of, uh, of Germany, there is the example of France, and there is the example of US. So the first two countries have, in addition to the compulsory licensing provisions that they currently have in their own intellectual property or rather patent law uh, acts, they have enacted new laws that provide for special conditions uh, and in particular uh, for the use of patented uh, products because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So in March, both Germany and France have actually introduced new, uh, new legislation with regards to specifically tailor-made for COVID-19. In the case of US, it is still not approved but they also are considering an act uh, with regard to innovations in relation to COVID-19. And uh, I would make a last remark and perhaps then wait for some question meanwhile. What is interesting in their case is that they provide for a delay in the granting of the patents. And in exchange of that, they provide, uh, they propose rather because it's a draft uh, it's a draft bill, they propose an extended protection of 10 years. So said in simpler words, if a pharmaceutical company in the US would happen to come up with an antiviral drug that cures COVID-19 or with a COVID-19 vaccine, if this act is approved, it would mean that they would not get the patent protection right away. They would only get it once the state of national emergency finishes. And in exchange of that, once they get the patent, they wouldn't get the normal term of protection of patents, which is 20 to 25 years. So it's a minimum of 20, but it can be more than that. And in addition to that, they will get 10 plus years of protection in exchange for the advantages and the benefits that we as a society would get out of using the product that is not protected by a patent. So I think, as an introductory uh, part, I hope that you are following me and you are all with me. But I think my colleague 
might have some questions because I see from his face that there are some issues to clarify. Uh, thank you very much, Nyada, for, for the presentation. And I would uh, encourage the, uh, the audience to ask questions. Uh, and you can do it here uh, in chat, or, and you can do it in both Russian and uh, in English language. The, the, the language of the webinar is English, but you can ask questions also in, in Russian if you don't feel comfortable enough to do it uh, in English. And then, of course, uh, I will uh, ask this, uh, I will voice these questions. Meanwhile, oh, I would like to ask maybe a couple of clarifying questions uh, concerning the, uh, the presentation. So, um, they would go to, a couple of them would, would, would of course go to compulsory, com compulsory licen uh, licensing uh, issue. So you said, uh, uh, when you, you, so I would, I would ask you like this, uh, these compulsory licenses, they are granted only when there is a national health emergency situation or are there any other situations when they may be granted? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, compulsory licensing is in fact not exclusively connected to situations of national uh, health emergency. But uh, in the text of Article 31 of TRIPS, there is a um, enumeration of cases when uh, compulsory licensing might apply, but it's rather in the, in the role of examples of such kind of situations. It's not a black laundry list, as to say, or finished a conclusive uh, list of cases when compulsory licensing is used. In common um, discussions with regard to compulsory licensing, they always, almost always revolve around medicine and around access to, to medicine. And that is why this is the, the most usual case when compulsory licensing are used. So in case of extreme uh, urgency situation, in case of health emergency. However, there are other scenarios when we can see the application of compulsory licensing. Um, the member states of WTO and TRIPS. Uh, okay. I think my screen is already shared or not. Help me here. It was, uh, there was a presentation uh, shared by you, but now there is no presentation. Okay, maybe we are having a technical glitch. Anyhow, to, to finish my, my, uh, my answer. Uh, other situations when we might see compulsory licensing are also situations when there is uh, a concerted practice that might uh, restrict competition. So compulsory licensing can be used as, an, uh, as a way to repair or to correct anti-competitive behavior also in the cases when there is a monopoly. So if there is a company which is the only one in a given market, national market, that produces, let's say the balls to stick to our uh, examples, but the price is exorbitantly uh, high, the government might use compulsory licensing in order to grant the permission to another company to produce these same, these same uh, valves. The moment that you would have more than one producer, uh, the laws and supply demand would apply. If there are more than one company that has been licensed, even more so, the price would become, would become cheaper because more providers would be providing the same, uh, the same product. I hope I, I, I address the question. Yes, I, th I think now it's clear that it's not only limited uh, to medical emergency, but of course, medical emergency is something we are interesting. We we are interested right now uh, because of our situation. Um, but talking about a little bit more, uh, I think clarification is needed. Uh, we do understand that compulsory license, so I do understand that compuls compulsory license uh, in a way limits the rights of the uh, owner, owner of the patent. So, uh, but what exactly happens uh, to that rights of the owner? Um, can you provide some examples or just kind of uh, uh, map, a, map for us this 
issue of the rights of the owner. Okay, thank you for the question. Now and by the way, I'm sorry for, to, to interrupt you. Um, do you need your presentation back for that? Uh, no. Okay. I can, I can answer right now. Now, um, what, uh, what would be the rights of the patent owner in the case of compulsory licensing? Now, the term is a bit, um, it's a bit illusory because compulsory means mandatory. So one would think that the moment that the license is mandatory, the patent owner doesn't have the right to use the patent anymore. But that is not the situation. So uh, the term compulsory or mandatory refers only to the fact that the patent owner um, is not in general, because there are exceptions, is not in general uh, able to reject the compulsory, the compulsory licensing. However, this doesn't mean that once a license is granted to another company, the original company cannot use the patented product anymore. So in the case of our, um, uh, our Volt, in case there was a compulsory licensing granted to Isinova, the startup company that was the, the, the subject of our, of our story, this wouldn't mean that the original manufacturer would stop producing Volts uh, of its own. So they are supposed to, to, to be used uh, simultaneously, so to speak. So the compulsory license does not restrict um, the right of the patent owner to actually use the patent at the same time that compulsory, uh, that compulsory licensing um, applies. And certainly all the other rights in relation to the patented product would still be applicable against um, third companies or individuals uh, in addition to the one which got the compulsory uh, licenses. Um, th thank you. But also, I would like to ask you this. Uh, yes. If we're talking about the procedures uh, of the granting of the compulsory license, um, it was not clear, but it seems to me that uh, the uh, owner of the patent doesn't have a say in it. So basically, uh, can can let imagine so there is that i'm a pa owner of a patent may i oppose the granting of the compulsory license uh, because otherwise if i don't have uh this uh option of of opposing it does it sound like a fair balance because you were talking about striking a fair balance in this situation mm -hmm. I understand, uh, I understand your question. Uh, so as I said, in general, and I specifically use that term, uh, the patent owner uh, cannot reject the issuing of a, uh, of a license. But, so it, it doesn't have a say in whether the license is issued or not. However, in many national legislations that include compulsory licensing provision, the patent owner can actually uh, object to the to the granting of the uh, to the granting of the compulsory uh, license. Then, whether that objection will be taken into consideration, whether it will be successful or not, is a different issue. But such right uh, exists. Also, in cases when it's not. Um, a situation of extreme urgency, there should be an initial step, as I already mentioned, of negotiation with the patent owner. So the, the company or the individual who would like to get permission to produce the vaults in our, in our case would have to go first and discuss with the original manufacturer and try to reach um, a remuneration, so a fee, that would be uh, applicable for the use of, uh, of this patent. So the patent owner has some rights, but in times of national emergency, these rights are overridden, most of them at least. 
I see. Um, thank you very much. Um, also, you mentioned uh, that uh, the provisions of those compulsory licensing allow us uh, the quicker access to drugs, diagnostics, uh, to vaccines. Mm -hmm. But um, you also mentioned that the scope is limited, which means that usually, uh, as far as I understand, that, that, that compulsory licensing would be limited to the territory, to the, to the territory of a given country. Um, you mentioned Italy, for example, right? Yes. Which means that, uh, am I right to assume that it also means that if there is a compulsory licensing in Italy, I cannot just produce it in Italy and export, for example, uh, those medicines or drug, or can I? Okay, I see, I see what you mean. So what I was talking about during this webinar is rather the case of uh, compulsory licensing in regards to importing of the volves in this case or potential COVID-19 vaccine or antiviral viral drug. So in this case, the scope would be limited in that if the manufacturer of these volves is an Italian company, there is a patent on that valve registered in Italy. And there is then a license that is provided, a compulsory license that is given to another company so that they start producing these valves it, it, at, a, at, a, at a cheaper price and also in bigger, in bigger quantities so that we could cope with, uh, with the rhythms of this, of this infection. The limited uh, element in the scope of the license here would be that this company which got the compulsory um, license would not be allowed to sell these products to Belarus, for example. So those products would be produced for, be, for purposes of being used in Italy and for non-commercial purposes, so only to face the crisis. However, there is also another type of compulsory um, licenses. Um, so if we refer to Article 31 of TRIPS, there is a so-called paragraph six system, which was amended during the uh, Doha round of negotiations in the framework of WTO, the World Trade Organization. And this type of compulsory licensing was meant to address the issue that least developed countries might have in this regard. Because in Italy, it might be um, easy to have a pharmaceutical company producing the COVID-19 vaccine or an antiviral drug or a diagnostic kit in case there is a compulsory license because they have the producing capacity themselves. But if we go to these developed countries, the majority of them do not have a strong or might even have a no, not have at all a pharmaceutical industry. So even if a license was granted, a compulsory license was granted to them, uh, a company from these countries would not be able to produce because they simply don't have the capacities. So to correct how to say this, this, uh, this, this balance in regard to the use of compulsory licensing, which was at the disadvantage of these developed countries, there was an uh, amendment of provisions on compulsory licensing. So under paragraph six system, there can be the granting of a compulsory licensing for export purposes. So to transfer it to our example, the original manufacturing company in Italy would grant a compulsory licensing to an Italian pharmaceutical company to produce vaccine, viral drug, or our valve as in the initial example, but only for purposes of exporting these products to, let's say, uh, Congo, for example, or any other country that is in the list of the least developed uh, countries as published by the World uh, Bank. So in this case, it would only, it would not be only for import purposes, but it would be for exporting as well. But again, there is no commercial, uh, uh, commercial advantage here. So it would not be for commercial advantaging. The, the labeling requirements will still apply. And um, also the territorial scope would be limited only for that country that uh, is in need of this product, not for uh, wide distribution and trade of, uh, of the product. So I 
I so in, I in, other, in other words, the third yes. countries may also benefit from compulsory licensing. Yes, oh. exactly. Okay, that's... Uh, it was indeed in, in the context of the needs of these countries, which were before struggling with HIV, malaria, and other uh, uh, serious diseases, that compulsory licensing was initially actually discussed at all. Sure, I see. So b basically... Uh, to ensure uh, I, their access to medicine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We know that uh, during the, the pandemics, a lot of countries uh, uh, experienced a lack of... Uh, a lack of testing systems and uh, in a way they were even fighting for uh, and you know different systems in different parts of the world try to uh, to buy it before other countries bo uh, would, would buy it so in this mm -hmm. sense if we have a country that is least developed country and they don't have enough uh, or at all uh, testing systems so they might actually benefit from uh, from compulsory licensing somewhere in European country. All right, yes. thank you very much. So we have a, a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Um, one, uh, uh, one participant asks um, uh, a sort of clarifying uh, question. And the, as far as I understand the question, uh, okay. the issue is whether, this, uh, whether there can be a use of compulsory license after the emergency situation is gone. So let's assume there is an emergency and there is a compulsory license granted. Mm -hmm. So it is clear that the, uh, the, pa the patent owner may still produce whatever we are talking about, medicine or the equipment. Mm -hmm. And another company uh, may also produce meanwhile. But let's say the emergency is over. Uh, does it mean that the compulsory licensing is over or it may still be in place? Uh, thank you for the question. So this has to do with the duration of the compulsory license. So the compulsory license is basically permission, so to, to, so to speak, in a simpler term. If this permission has a duration that is connected with the end of a national emergency uh, situation, it means that the application of that license is tied to the, to the duration of the state of national emergency. So the moment that the emergency would be over, the, license, the compulsory license would not be effective anymore. If, however, the duration is tied to some other element, sometimes a compulsory licensing might be connected to the life of the patent, so basically usually 20 years or depending how much a certain patent might, might last, then the compulsory license would be effective for as long as the, uh, the, the original patent is effective. Or there might be also a third case where there is a specific term, a specific duration, a tot number of years, for example, that is considered uh, appropriate depending on the type of, uh, of, uh, of product or process that is being uh, licensed through the compulsory licensing. And in that case, when that duration finish is done, that's when the compulsory license uh, should, be, uh, should be stopped from, from, from use, basically. So it's, to say it in different terms, it's like a contract. In the contract, you have a term for the duration of the contract. Once that expires, contract is not, is not valid anymore. The same applies to licenses. But just to make one, uh, one clarification here, you mentioned um, pharmaceutical products. Compulsory licensing is, as I said, not only connected to, to, to medicine, but even within products, it can be uh, applied to different kinds of products, even though usually it is connected to, to, to medicine and pharmaceutical products. But it can also be something, something different, not necessarily only that. Um, I see. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a, uh, a couple uh, uh, of questions. And one of them is uh, actually about the third countries benefiting from compulsory okay. license, a sort of clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, question and it is uh, so let's say Congo benefits uh, okay. from a compulsory license granted in 
in Lithuania. Mm -hmm. So in this example, who will pay remunerations? Who would That's be the... question. Who will pay the remuneration to the patent owner, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Uh, so again, in this case, we would be in front of the second type of compulsory licensing, the one that is ruled by a paragraph six system. So in this case, there are two possible scenarios. So if the um, original manufacturer, so the patent owner, so to speak, has already received remuneration in the country where the patent is registered, then um, Congo, in our case, uh, will not be paying remuneration unless its own legislation states differently because every country that is a member of TRIPS needs to, how to say, transpose the provisions of TRIPS, including those regulating compulsory licensing into their national legislation. So sometimes they do it in a different, in a different way. But with regard to least developed countries, usually the Congo, Congo, Congo legislation in this case would state that in case remuneration has been already paid in the country of origin, Congo is relieved from paying remuneration. However, in the case that the patent owner did not receive this remuneration with regard to, compuls to the compulsory license, always, he did not receive it in the country of origin, then Congo would have to pay, uh, to pay the remuneration. Then Thank you very if much. we want to talk about the, the amount that depends, sometimes it can be um, anywhere between 3.5 to 4% of the total value of the products basically granted, uh, produced under this compulsory license. But again, this will depend on specific legislation of the, of the country who, for whose benefit the products are produced under the compulsory license. Thank you. Um, uh, another question is from uh, the person who clearly has an understanding of how business work works. Okay. So uh, I will just read it. It is clear uh, uh, what, you, what you said about non-commercial purpose uh, of uh, compulsory licensing. But still a manufacturer which was granted a compulsory license Mm -hmm. uh, should earn some money to cover the fees that are due to the original manufacturer and costs for, for example, for materials, uh, for, because it has to produce from materials mm -hmm. and um, also workers involved, so they had to be paid the salary and so on. So is there any regulation uh, concerning this issue? So basically, because I'm producing without benefiting from it, not for, no, I mean, I'm producing for non-commercial purposes. Mm -hmm. How are my expenses as a producer covered? Okay. I, I think I understand the question, but then um, hopefully the person who asked will, will, will write again in case I, I missed the point. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned it actually already, the moment, or rather, the fact that there is a compulsory license issued doesn't mean that the original manufacturer, so the patent owner, in this case, will stop producing for other markets. When I say that there is a limited scope and there is, it shouldn't be a commercial purpose after the compulsory licensing, I am talking only about those products which are produced by the company which got the compulsory license. So this is where the non-commercial purpose begins. So the company is getting the license in order to address a critical health uh, emergency, not to gain benefit. But this is not, so this is not to be interpreted in relation to the original manufacturer. The original manufacturer can still continue to produce the patent for other, for other markets. So the patent doesn't stop its life so to so to speak because the term of protection is still valid just because there is a compulsory license the non-commercial purpose is only in relation to those products which the third company that benefits from the compulsory licensing is producing that one shouldn't have the benefits not the original uh, owner so to speak or i think 
I think that is more or less clear. Yeah. I think that the question was about that second company. Ah, that, because the that, way you said it, I, I, okay. That second company that doesn't the produce it for commercial purposes still has expenses. There are workers that are mm -hmm. working, you know, the, the materials to be used and, uh, and packages to be used and stuff like that. So how are those are covered? Okay, so in that case, the company that would be producing uh, the products, the non-commercial meaning of, of, uh, of the criteria here would be that they cannot distribute it in other countries, but in the country where they are bringing the drugs, the drugs would still be, the drugs would still be sold. But rather, if the compulsory licensing has been granted in the case of a paragraph six system for the benefit of Congo, let's stick to, to Congo, then they can produce it and it can be traded only in, in Congo. The non-commercial, um, I think now I see why the question. <laughs> I had a, an enlightenment moment. <laughs> so there are two types of compulsory licensing. This limitation in the, in the commercial nature is rather uh, connected to the case when the compulsory license is used for production in, um, within, within a specific country that has the capacity to produce. So the company that is producing is in, a, is in the country where the drug will be produced, to make it more specific. The example of Congo will be the second type of compulsory licensing where uh, they have another company that is producing for, for, uh, for, their, for their purposes. So the non-commercial use would be for the, uh, for the usual type of compulsory licensing. In the case of least developed uh, countries, depending on the requirement of the compulsory license, they would still be not required to go in, the, in all countries of Africa, for example, unless that is what that license states. But within that specific country, they would have to still sell the products. It's just that they are not allowed to produce anywhere they want, just because they got the license to produce the, the drug, the vaccine, or, or whatnot. Okay, I hope now I, I address the issue. <laughs> I, I think it is, uh, is clear now. Um, we also have a couple of questions that I'm not sure they're related. Uh, they're definitely not related to compulsory licensing, and I'm not sure uh, you will be in a position to answer uh, okay. those questions. But I still will will ask. Um, and and to the participants, I will say you always may ask a question, but you might not get an answer. So uh, Eastern Partnership countries demonstrate a significant Mm -hmm. Joe is considered as a vivid, uh, a vivid example of a sort of, uh, a sort of libertarian approach when no mm -hmm. local licensing is, is needed as long as the drug is already registered in uh, a different jurisdiction, in a different country. Mm -hmm. So if okay. a, a, a drug is registered in Lithuania, uh, it's fine with Georgian authorities. Now, Belarus demonstrates another extreme uh, as the person is writing, where you can you get criminal penalty even for bringing Teraflu from Lithuania. Now the question is, mm -hmm. and I and I think Teraflu from Lithuania not for personal use definitely, but in order to mm -hmm. to to trade. The question is which of the two of those approaches is closer to European Union practice? Okay, now I, I'm seeing the question in the. Uh... In the example, I'm not sure I understand exactly the abbreviation. Perhaps Maximus could jump in and and. Uh, I actually, sorry, I forgot <laughs> to uh, switch on uh, my uh, mic. Uh, actually, I checked what this DCFTA agreement means. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is uh, a deep and comprehensive free trade area. It's the the area of free trade between the European Union and a couple of other countries, including Georgia. Uh, so it is a, it's quite specific, but I think if you may uh, answer to the first part of the question, basically about whether it is closer, which is one, which one is a clo closer to EU regulation, and you might not be in a position to answer because the topic is, is, is different, but anyways. Uh, well, yeah, this is a bit, uh, 
it's a bit outside of my, my, my field of expertise, but let me try to, to provide an answer. Now, here I would have to, uh, to understand first what local licensing means. Does it, means that, does it mean that the product would not be protected by a patent in, in, in a country or what you are referring here is simply the situation where, let's say, the compulsory licensing is issued in Italy and Italy produces for purposes of, uh, of Georgia. So to use a specific drug or vaccine in, in Georgia. If that is the case, which is the case closer to the topic that, that we are uh, discussing today, then that would, be, uh, that would be perfectly all right. So in fact, in the case of compulsory licensing for exporting, uh, which is also, by the way, uh, adopted in EU legislation when it comes to compulsory licensing, uh, it is perfectly normal not to have a patent protection for a drug. Why? Because the drug is not being produced in that country. It's rather being produced in the country of origin. The important thing is for the country of origin to have the patent rather than for the receiving country in the case of a paragraph six system uh, compulsory licensing. In fact, there are many countries which do not have a, uh, uh, a regulation of, uh, of patents at all, at all. So these developed countries are in fact, uh, can adopt with regard to patent protection in particular in the case of, uh, of pharmaceuticals. Uh, can you still hear me? Uh, I hear with interruptions, but, but now I hear fine. Yeah. Can you see me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Because there was an internet issue. So if we talk from the perspective, Georgia is certainly not the least developed country, but I'm making a parallel here with the situation suggested, um, by, by, uh, by Maximus, it can perfectly be that the country doesn't have itself a legislation because it's in the interest of the least developed country not to have actually a strong uh, patent uh, patent protection system precisely because they don't have their own capacities to produce it if they had very rigid systems then it would be very difficult for them to get access to to, to medicine and so on but certainly what belarus displays here is unusual that, I, that um, much i can say yeah um, <laughs> Maximus actually shared uh, a, a link to, to the, to the mm -hmm. article that concerns okay. Belarus and, and that actually concerns... It's in Russian, right? Uh, okay. It is in Russian, but it actually concerns private individuals. So some okay. private individuals were bringing Teraflu and Gripex, which are, you know, the, the drugs that you would use to, uh, to tackle the, uh, the symptoms of uh, general flu. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they were facing criminal convictions because of certain elements in those drugs that are in a way prohibited in the country. But ah. again... Okay, that's a different issue. In case the, uh, the drugs uh, would be counterfeited or they are brought in the territory of Belarus as a parallel import, then that would be a different issue. There are countries in the world who have uh, criminal sanctions in relation to violations of intellectual property law, including patent law. Now, unfortunately, I do not know how Belarus stands in this regard, but if they apply a criminal penalty, I would have to know now the exact elements. But if, if, if it was a counterfeited item or item that it is being pirated into the, into the country without an authorization from the patent owner in the case of Teraflu, then Belarus apparently has criminal sanctions for these uh, for these cases. Um, we have uh, one question, mm -hmm. probably is the last one. Um, being a prospective student, uh, let's say uh, that I dream of working at one of the big pharma companies, such as Pfizer, for example, and um, um, and dealing with the regulatory issues. Is master's degree in law enough or should I also get a certain training uh, in the field of biology or pharmacy or medi um, uh, medical science? Well, 
Well, it depends on what the prospective student would like to be. If the prospective student would like to be a compliance officer, for example, so it would be in a lawyer uh, position or in a, in a legal uh, capacity, then attending a, master, uh, a master's degree which has courses on uh, intellectual property law, if we are talking about pharmaceuticals, most probably patent law would be more, uh, more adept. But in, if there is an intellectual property uh, course and a WTO law course, the student would already have a very good initial understanding, at least theoretical, from the point of view of, uh, of principles and, and knowledge. It would be already at a very good point to start working as a compliance officer. Then with practice, the experience would be gained. But it would be a good initial point. Absolutely. So the compliance officer is a, a person, a, a professional uh, that works in the company and uh, 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 basically is looking that the company doesn't violate uh, the regulations in, in, in a specific field. In this sense, it would be the field of patent law uh, and uh, intellectual, property law, intellectual. intellectual property law in general, if we are talking about pharmaceuticals. And you said that intellectual property uh, course and WTO TO course would be a good start uh, and maybe, good and maybe start even and enough to, we, to get the position. We offer both of them at the European Humanities Universities. So whoever is interested in working in this capacity and in this industry would have a very good starting point with us. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that would conclude our uh, webinar. And... Uh, if I don't know whether Maximus has uh, uh, a, a connection right now, so if he does, he would uh, most probably join us and uh, t uh, say goodbye. If he doesn't, sure. I, I he do does. have Max. I should, I'm here. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, I, although I have some issues with my video cam, but nevertheless, I just wanted to thank you and Miada for a very thorough, very, very, very deep discussion on uh, just is to demonstrate in us once again how interdisciplinary this world is and how interconnected it is. And uh, sometimes indeed with this, uh, this uh, great uh, kicking off point that you have started Niada with showing us the situation in Italy, it demonstrates again that uh, not always good intentions, they end up with, uh, well, let's say with the legal framework, but there is always a solution that can be found. And uh, from what we know is that students and graduates of PHU of our law program, they are particularly creative and particularly talented in finding ways and means how to uh, find uh, solutions to complicated problems. And this is a probably distinctive feature that a genuine lawyer must have. And for those of prospective students who have been attending at this webinar or watching right now the record on YouTube, I just want to highlight once again that by July 5th, we are waiting for your application forms that are submitted fully online and 2020 is the year when you can apply to EHU straight away from your home. And you need not to go to any other places to, because you can do everything from home. You can pass the entrance exams and the motivational interview and uh, even receive a scholarship for your studies at EHU, not leaving your apartment. So to find out more, please visit uh, ehu.lt and uh, we're happy to see you at the International Law and European Union Law Program at EHU, which is a five-year LLM program and providing you master's degree in law in the spirit of international law and European Union law. Thank you, Niada, and thank you, Maxim. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.